So welcome everyone to another episode of Dark Chatter. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce today um, Maddie Zorowski from the University of Melbourne. So Maddie is doing um, her PhD um, uh, at the University of Melbourne um, with the Sabre experiment. Um, so thank you very much for, for being with me to, to do this Dark Chatter. Um, can we start just by you introducing yourself, sort of talking about um, how you ended up um, getting involved with Sabre and, and sort of where you are at your, your studies at the moment? For sure. Um, so I got involved with Sabre at the start of my master's degree, which was in 2017, um, with my supervisor, Elizabeth. So I've been working on it for the last four and a bit years now. I'm in the third year of my PhD officially as of a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I initially started just looking at what the capability of Sabre was at its most basic, um, looking at kind of really simple dark matter models. And that's kind of scaled up to more and more complex situations uh, now that I'm in my PhD. Um, in general, to kind of give a bit of scope of Sabre for anyone who might not have heard about it before, uh, basically what we're trying to do is provide a model independent test of the DAMA LIBOR results. So this experiment DAMA that's been observing a pretty significant or statistically significant signal for the last 20 years or so um, that seems to agree with everything that we know about dark matter, aside from the fact that they're the only ones that have been able to observe it. Um, in a lot of cases, this means that, you know, DAMA is pretty heavily constrained and a lot of people don't really think that the signal is, could, could be attributed to dark matter anymore. Um, but you can kind of get around this a little bit by saying, you know, maybe different kinds of targets interact in wildly different ways with dark matter. Uh, so you can start to tailor more and more specific models that kind of leave you with sodium iodide, which is the target Dama used, as the only thing that could potentially even see any kind of interaction with dark matter. So in order to properly test Dama, you have to do it with the same sort of target, which is what Sabre is doing. It's growing these ultra pure sodium iodide crystals that we're going to stick underground in the southern hemisphere uh, for a couple of years and then see what we see. Yes, yeah, so I think it's, it's probably worth mentioning that that um, this this Dharma result has been in incredibly long standing and has, has caused theorists to have to be extremely creative to come up with ways of, it, of explaining <laughs> it. Um, and I guess it's 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 probably important that we that we shout out some of the other experiments like Anice and, and Cosine, who are also kind of doing the same thing, essentially trying to to replicate the experiment. Um, what what would you say is kind of the most novel thing about about Sabre specifically um, that sort of makes it stand out from its its competitors? Yeah, there's probably uh, two main things, I'd say. The first is that we're in the Southern Hemisphere, whereas uh, Cosine and Anais are both based in the Northern Hemisphere, which is the same place that Dama was. Um, the reason this is important is because if dark matter is what's causing the signal at Dama, then we expect it to be the same exact signal in uh, the Northern and the Southern Hemisphere, so it should be exactly in phase. Um, most of the other backgrounds that could mask the sort of modulation, so things like solar muons, for example, we expect to change phase in the southern hemisphere. So it will give us a really easy check if we see a modulation out of phase of Dama. We can immediately be like, no, it's, it's the muons or something else. It's not dark matter. Um, the second thing that we're using that so far uh, cosine and a nice aren't is a liquid veto. Um, so this means that uh, we have all of our crystals totally immersed in a liquid scintillator, which gives us a much better background coverage so we can uh, extract any signals that might be causing some kind of illumination in our crystals that isn't due to dark matter, it's due to some kind of background radiation. So yeah. in fact, we've got a lower background than the other two experiments. I suppose we do We do have to talk about backgrounds. I mean, we will get to the dark matter because um, uh, we will eventually talk about um, a paper that you that you recently wrote. Um, but but before we do get to dark matter, let's let's talk a bit about backgrounds because we are going to have to reckon with the fact that this thing could well be a background. Even though I think we all would really like this to be a, a signal of dark matter. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what are sort of your um, your favorite ideas for for the true origin of the signal? Either either ones which you think are the most plausible, or, or kind of ones which are like maybe the most fun or, or kind of wacky that you mm. have. I mean, obviously, in my heart of hearts, I really hope it is dark matter. Um, and then we get to come in and prove it. And maybe Elizabeth will get nominated for Nobel Prize and she'll take me to the ceremony. That's the uh, <laughs> the dream scenario. Um, realistically, it probably could be muons um, or something related to the muons. I know a lot of people have done some work about uh, instead of it being directly matched with the muons, which you can have kind of shielding from, the muons could be causing some kind of uh, neutron spallation, which then gives you your signal um, in the crystals themselves. 
My favorite wacky one I've seen was a paper that was published by, I think, three people who were related to each other who suggested that it could be because of helium leaking in the PMTs. Um, so and as the temperature changes, you have a increase or decrease of helium that's leaking into the PMT and kind of causing these spurious events. Um, I'm pretty sure it's not that, but it's a fun and interesting explanation for what it could be. Yeah, so the, I, I do remember this this paper that you were talking about. But, so the, these three people weren't, weren't actually kind of related to the experiment at all, were they? Did, did they just sort of have this idea? and Because it, it's a, such an oddly specific um, thing to come up with. Uh, yeah, I think... I think that they are working on a new photo detection technology. So they were kind of wanting to also demonstrate that, you know, PMTs aren't the best possible solution for cases like this. So there's a bit of an ulterior motive there, I think. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, so let's um, talk about um, a paper that you recently wrote. So, so you were recently um, involved in this uh, Sort of, I guess, phenomenological study um, with uh, Elisabetta Barbario and, and Giorgio Bassoni. Um, so the title of your paper, which is, I, I think, published recently, right, in, in, in JCAP, um, is, is uh, Inelastic Dark Matter and the Sabre Experiment. Um, so can you, can you first just sort of start by explaining how um, you first got involved in, in this study? What, what was sort of proposed to you and, and what, what, what sort of drew you to this kind of um, more phenomenological aspect? So when I first started my master's, I was kind of tossing up between doing TPP and EPP because in my little undergraduate mind, I didn't even really know that phenomenology was a thing. Uh, so when I decided that I was going to stick with EPP and go with Elizabetta, she told me that we could kind of try and tailor a project that would involve a bit of theory stuff. So she teamed me up with Giorgio, who was a TPP postdoc at Melbourne at the time, um, with the idea being that I could sort of investigate different exotic models and what they might actually look like in the Sabre experiments. It would require kind of his knowledge and understanding of the theory landscape and then my experimental understanding of how the physical process of detection actually works. Um, so the model that he proposed that we look into was this inelastic uh, dark matter. Um, and so I've spent probably th three years now kind of really getting to know the ins and outs of that. Yeah, so I guess that's um, that's the first thing that, that we have to explain. What so we know what dark matter is. What is what is inelastic dark matter? What what is inelastic about it, and what, why is this particularly interesting for an experiment like Sabre? So this is one of those kind of specially tailored models I mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, inelastic dark matter is a particular kind of dark matter that can only interact by upscattering into a heavier state. So instead of just one simple dark matter particle, you've actually got two: one that's low mass, one that's high mass. Um, and depending on the mass difference between these and the mass of the target that you're dealing with, you can constrain the velocity space of the dark matter. So you're effectively increasing the minimum velocity that the dark matter has in order for an interaction to occur. Um, so you can combine this with the fact that there's some maximum velocity that dark matter can have in the galaxy and tailor the mass difference between the low mass and high mass dark matter states so that you essentially leave low mass targets blind. So we like that for Sabre because there's a lot of experiments that have used uh, targets that are a lot lighter than sodium or lighter than iodine. Um, and so we can say, you know, iodine is the lowest possible mass that can interact with this dark matter, um, set the constraints based on that, and then you essentially wipe out a whole bunch of other experiments that are supposedly constraining gamma. Yes, it sounds like quite a, a simple way of sort of, a, a, of gaining sensitivity in a new part of the prime space where other experiments would be um, kind of completely blind. Um, what, what, so there's another there's another aspect to this, particularly in in your um, paper, um, in in terms of getting even more freedom um, to kind of ex escape other other bounds, and that and that's going through this um, effective field theory um, formalism. Mm -hmm. um, now that this this formalism is is kind of fairly rich because it's it's kind of so general. Um, how how does this work in terms of your actual work? How do you how do you kind of boil down this this kind of complex framework with all of these free constants? Um, into kind of signals that you can actually predict in, in, in your experiment and, and kind of evaluate the sensitivity to? Yeah, so I kind of take advantage of the fact that with effective field theory, you don't need to know the ins and outs of what's actually uh, driving the interaction process. All I care about is that you've got one dark matter coming in, hitting the nucleus and going out. So I don't need to worry about the mediating particle or anything like that, which automatically cuts out a whole bunch of um, annoying calculations that I would have to do otherwise. So then you're left with, I think, about 15 or so effective operators that you have to look at and worry about. 
and uh, any kind of uh, overlap or interaction between the two of them. So there's some that uh, cross over a little bit. Um, and the computation strategy that I've used is quite similar to one that uh, was proposed in a paper that first suggested these kind of specialized and elastic uh, dark matter models, which is where you can treat the sum of all of the uh, form factors of the effective field theories as a vector. And then you end up with a matrix in the middle that's got all of your coupling constants that are associated with each of the form factors. And by choosing a particular model, you're essentially setting this matrix. So if you wanted to set, say, all of the coupling constants except for two of them to zero, you can do that quite easily by just defining your matrix there. Yeah, so you've got this potentially huge amount of freedom. Is there? Is I guess it's interesting to think about what are the sort of configurations of that matrix which, which give you sort of things that, um, types of signal, which maybe you wouldn't expect. Is, do, do you find any um, particular combinations of these constants where the, the signals in, in a Sabre-like experiment end up being sort of drastically different from the, the kind of usual um, cases that people consider? I mean, I've cheated a little bit and I haven't fit any of the specific coupling constants. I've stolen some of the uh, particularly good ones that uh, Kang, Stoppel and Tomar proposed in 2019. Um, and I do think that fitting the coupling constants themselves would be quite a computationally tough task. Um, but I do think that's also interesting and partic particularly important if we wanted to look at maybe the sorts of things that the Southern Hemisphere data could give us. We could look at perhaps more particular uh, velocity distributions of something that would produce a more distinct difference uh, between the Northern and Southern Hemisphere or uh, bigger modulation or something like that. Yeah, because that's the sort of final um, piece of of, um, of additional kind of theory input that you need here, which is the, the, this velocity distribution for dark matter. Can you can you explain a bit what the sort of role is of the velocity distribution for for dark matter experiments in general, and then what what is kind of the the specific role that it has for these kind of annual modulation based searches? Yeah. So the way I explain it to a lot of my undergraduate students is when you're looking at a rate of interaction, you kind of need to know two main ingredients. Um, that is kind of how many particles are meeting each other to interact, um, which is the velocity distribution, and then how likely that interaction is to occur, which is the effective field theory in this case. So the velocity distribution is just kind of telling you uh, where the dark matter is in our galaxy and how fast it is when it hits us, which we can then apply the effective field theory to to work out the likelihood of an interaction. Um, it's particularly important for these inelastic dark matter models because, as I said, they constrain the minimum velocity that's allowed. So Often the effective field theory operators that we're looking at have a stronger velocity dependence than ones such as the standard uh, kind of spin independent WIMP case that most people look at. Um, so because these are more sensitive to velocity distributions, there's a chance that um, if we consider particular velocity distributions, you might actually get an increase in rate. So the one that I looked at was the um, standard halo model plus stream that I actually think you're an author on, Kieran. I didn't realize that uh, when we first met. Um, and in that model, I mean, you might be able to talk about it a little bit more than I do. Um, you essentially have uh, an increase in velocity for a part of the high velocity region. So by that token, if you're then looking at an inelastic dark matter model case where you're constraining the minimum velocity, if you're shifting it to these higher velocity regions, you'd actually expect an increase in rate when you're looking at the uh, standard halo model plus stream compared to just the standard halo model where you have a, a lower interaction. Yeah, so putting all of that together, I guess, so we have this interesting, potentially uh, potentially interesting for, for annual modulation based such as um, a, a model which can kind of escape um, other bounds um, being inelastic dark matter. And then we have this effective field theory formalism adding all of this additional freedom in terms of these um, these constants. And then we have, you know, the uncertainty surrounding the velocity distribution. So putting all that together, what, what would you say is kind of the takeaway from from this study? What what what? did you learn, um, apart from sort of how to implement all of these kind of calculations, what, what did you learn that maybe surprised you and, and, and would maybe kind of inspire um, maybe a follow-up study? Um, I guess just kind of how many dials there are to turn in things like this, um, because I was introduced to it all very kind of slowly. I saw like the kind of most basic and elastic dark matter model, and then I was introduced to the effective field theories, and as you said, there's all the coupling constants there. And then I was introduced to the other velocity distributions of which I only looked at one other one. I know there's so many more. Um, 
so yeah, just how many bells are on a chart and how computationally difficult a task it is to do a proper thorough fit to all the possible parameter spaces for even just this one particular dark matter model, let alone all of the other ones that people have thought of. So is this kind of um, study, this this, the, this sort of theoretical phenomenological study, is this um, the sort of thing that you, you, you are planning on doing more of in the future, either you or, or other PhD students um, in SABO? Is, is this something that, that is sort of supposed to be supporting the kind of general motivation for SABO? Um, what, what are the sort of current um, feelings around, around these kinds of studies? Yeah, so I think at the moment we're now switching more to look at uh, other useful ways of using parts of our detector. So things like um, using our liquid veto and muon detectors to do kind of particle ID and really reduce the background. Um, because one thing that a lot of my sensitivity studies have shown is that the lower the background is, you get a, a much, much bigger payback than you would just by simply increasing the mass. Um, which I think is a bit of a change from the way a lot of people who might be used to collider physics are um, used to thinking because they're kind of like, you know, the more mass, the more events you get, the more likelihood you have of seeing a dark matter event. Um, but in this case, adding more mass can mean adding a lot more uh, kind of dirty background. Mm. <laughs> Sorry, Elizabeth is just coming in. Fine, yeah. Okay, so well, we're, we're back. The, um, the boss just, just came in, so we had to, we had to cut <laughs> Um, so where, where were we? Um, um, well, I, I think we, we sort of, we're, we're about um, wrapping up. I, I think probably what a lot of people would want to know is kind of what is the sort of timeline and then and the current status and the next stages for, for Sabre. Um, so can you, can you talk a bit about what the sort of the, the, uh, the role of Australia in general and specifically the, the center of excellence for dark matter is in, in Sabre right now? Yeah, I mean, I've spoken quite a bit about the benefits of going to the Southern Hemisphere. So that's only going to become even bigger with having a lot more people available and resources and time and money to dedicate to the search. Um, obviously, COVID's kind of thrown our timeline off a little bit, but uh, the lab's been excavated. So I think we're in the process of getting it all built up under there. And hopefully we'll start taking data in the next year or so, fingers crossed. I mean, I personally really want some data before I finish up my PhD. Um, and I think now that everything's in the works and starting to roll according to schedule, we're starting to think about other useful ways we could use the Sabre detector, even if we don't observe any dark matter, um, or if we do, how we could continue to use it in the future. Um, so looking at things like, say, observing the muon modulation, uh, other kinds of rare physics searches that we could do with something where we've spent all this time producing an ultra low background detector. It's a shame if we can only use it to say, no, this doesn't work. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're we're all pretty um, excited about about where um, this this could lead after after Sabre. Um, so, you, have you been to the to the site personally, or do you do you hope to to go at some point um, soon? No, I haven't been. I'm hoping I'm going to get to go for the uh, big ribbon cutting ceremony. Uh, I'm part of the team that's getting training to do uh, some kind of heights and enclosed spaces so we can actually go into the Sabre vessel itself and kind of help to clean it and make it as reflective as possible. So I'm hoping that if they're putting me in danger in that way, I'll uh, get the payback of getting to go to the lab. Yeah, I think they'll be excited. Have you been to a, an underground lab um, at all? Have you been to a, a, um, one of the other ones? No, I haven't. I was supposed to be going to Italy last year to check out LNGS, but so far I've only I've uh, gotten to go to Princeton to look at some of the crystal growing facilities. I haven't actually been underground yet. Yeah, I've I've only been to one with, in, uh, in in Cam Frank, which is where Anais is. Um, mm. But I, I only went there for a, for a visit as part of a conference. It's it was very very cool, and I felt very very out of my element as a theorist. <laughs> yes, well, I, I really hope that I can visit this um, this stall at some point. Um, so yeah, thank you again for for, for chatting with me. I think um, this was this has been really good. Um, so this is our fourth dark chatter now. Hopefully, we we should be producing many more um, in the future. Um, thanks again for joining me, and then uh, I'll 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 see you around. Hi. Great.